حبيبه إن الله وملائكته يسلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما الله وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وإذا حييتم بتحية فحيوا بأحسن منها أو ردها إن الله كان على كل شيء حسيبا صدق الله صدق الله الرزيم My dear brethren, I begin with Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh I want you to bear this in mind that I started with salam Usually this is not my practice Not that I do not wish salams to my audience, no It's a matter of habit I'm used to reading a verse from the Quran and get stuck into the subject straight away no beating around the bush but for some special reason I started this talk with salams and I will tell you why as we get along I will come to it why I said salam alaikum at the beginning though I am not averse to other people starting with salams it's good, beautiful but I said it's out of habit with me I read an ayah and I start talking about the ayah. Where is the ayah come from? This, that, that, what it means? And on into the subject. But I had a special reason. But before I proceed, I also want to congratulate this Jamaat for that little plastic sign. Will please somebody get it from heel on, heels on line. Will somebody please get it for me? There from the wall there. Heel. Heels on line. That's right. Shukran. Very simple thing. You know, this idea about heels on line, I have been wanting to talk to my brethren. Because in the Juma Masjid Durban, we have masjid the Juma, Juma masjid, the largest in the southern hemisphere is in Durban, and we have problems with the lions. You go to Saudi Arabia, you have problems with the lions. You go to England, America, the Muslims they have problem with the lions. And I want to tell them why you are having this problem. But I don't want to appear. So look, this clever guy now comes along from Africa and is telling us why we can't get the lions straight. For a thousand years, fourteen hundred years, we got Islam with us, and this guy here, this Hindi, this Indian fellow comes along and he's telling us now, he says, look, the problem with you is that certain basic things, fundamental things, elementary things you haven't understood. That you're not getting the line straight. Because you want to get your line straight with your toes. I said, you know, some people wear size five, size five shoes. Some people wear size 10, 10 and a half, 11, I wear 9. Can you see the difference now? Immediately as soon as you get onto the line with your toes, you are out of line. As you put your toe, I am wearing size 9, you are wearing size 5, another guy is wearing size 10 and a half, 11, the line is out. The heel. See, I have been training in the brigades. I was with the Pakistan National Guard. And I know when you say shoulder to shoulder is the heel that comes because the heel can't go out. You see your heels and everybody's heel is coming perpendicular, straight up. Shh. Now you know I'm telling all this. You know why? It's being recorded. This tape, inshallah, he'll go to the west. <laughs> see, I couldn't start talking to them there. I said, you see, my people, somebody had this good idea. I must congratulate that brother, whoever he is. There is a saying that my, that my conviction grows infinitely the moment another soul will believe in it. You know what I have in mind? If somebody else says, Dito, like this, I become boosted. So, mashallah. No, I'm on the right track. So, my brother, whoever did this, I say, you are on the right track. And the people who are hearing it in other countries, because this tape goes all over the world, they will also know why they are having the problems of not getting the line straight. The reason is the heels are not on the line. 
congratulations to you, to this Jamaat. And for many other things, I don't know, go in and they say you're wasting so much time. The subject that was chosen was, if the label shows your intent, wear it. And it's something strange, you never heard of it before, like a thing like that. If the label shows your intention, what you are about to do, what you want to do, so wear the label. Let the people know. Like this one here. There's a label here. This label says, the Shahada. La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. We had made others, metal ones. We said, the Quran speaks the word of God for universal guidance. Beautiful. Mono, this thing we had. And the IPC, Islamic Propaganda Center, we were selling it. And it's gone out of uh, use at the moment. But I think we should renew it. The Quran speaks the word of God for universal guidance. That's a label. So everybody sees it. Says, what is this Quran? So man has a tendency to want to know what it is. What is this Quran? Gives you an opportunity. The Quran is the word of God. Is I thought only the Bible is the word of God. Where did you get this from? Opportunity for you to talk. You see, if the label shows your intent, wear it. People know what you are, what you stand for. So I read this in a newspaper, written by a Westerner. He had some other reason for saying this. Good ideas he had. He is talking about some parties. People go to the parties and they don't know, they want to know how to get started with one another, how to chat, conversation. What do you talk about? So somebody thought of an idea. I said, look, let's put on something. Previously used to put names. And generally they put names. Ahmad Didat. Ahmad Didat means nothing to the other fellow. Ahmad Didat, yes. Where do you come from? Where not? You, Muhammad Siddiq. You, Abdul Rahim uh, Brown. So what? What am I going to talk with him? What do you want to talk? Difficult. So this says, now let's put down something, what you are specializing in. Philately. Philately. You know what's philately? Philately is the hobby of collecting stamps, postage stamps. There are people, they collect postage stamps. So a lady put it on. Philately. So now a fellow wants to get started with her. So he says, you know, I do etching. And if you want to see, I got some at home. So she says, look man, this is philately. I'm interested in stamps. But he says, you see, I'm from the foreign core. And you know, you know what I mean. In other words, he wants to take her home and the guys are going to show his etchings. But sex is behind his mind. And they made something, they said, look, now we want to know, let's find out. What should we, we want to make up these labels for people when we go to a conference. That when we get together, make it easy for people to talk. It's so, right, come on, tell us. What do you want to talk about? This is sex. You? You want to talk about sex. How about women? You? Sex. You? Sex. 100% of the guys, they want to talk about sex. They are hungry for that in the West. This is the only thing that they can talk about. There is nothing higher. Animality. Down. Down. Animality. They want to talk about sex. sex. So the person is asking the organizer, he said, did you a thousand people were to be gathered. He said, did you print a thousand labels? Sex, 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 sex. He said, no, it wasn't necessary. <laughs> They'll talk sex in any case. But there are people who are thinking ahead, who are on a higher level. There's one such group I came across. They call them the Young Presidents Organization. They have the headquarters, they have the centers all over the world. Young Presidents. Jimmy Carter, before he became president, he was a member of this, Young Presidents. Some of the leading lights in the world today, they have been members of the Young Presidents. It is a type of training. Certain type of people are, have the opportunity of meeting, you know, leaders from all over the world. And these are the potential leaders for the nations for the future. So they have opportunity of getting together. And they invite guest speakers, people from the outside to come and speak. And the last time they had this conference, it was in Dubai, in the UAE, they invited me. They gave me a first class air ticket for me and my son, 
and they gave me a five-star hotel accommodation. They did a beautiful job. They called me and they had called people from the Far East, from the West, from America, England, Germany, from Israel, from all over the world they had gathered there. Now, the guest speakers were specialists, like I am a specialist, in certain field. So they want me to put it down. What? As a comparative religion. I am a specialist in comparative religion. Dealing with Islam and other religions. In comparison. About Judaism, about Christianity, about Hinduism, about Buddhism. This is my field. You have a right to question me about these things. So, somebody else about politics, somebody about something else. And then they had different tables. And he said, now, these specialists, you take one one table each. You just take a table and you go and sit down. You are alone at the table. And the chairs, table and chairs right around. So now people start walking around. They look at your label. Well, he's interested in comparative the system. Somebody's not interested in that. He goes and, goes and sees the others. He says, mm, I want to go and find out something about this politician. Let me tap him. For his, tap his brains. And so on and so on. So I have my table full. Everybody has his table full. The label shows your intent, what you stand for, what you want to share. So get started straight away. As soon as you sit down, right, they have some questions. What is the difference between Islam and Christianity? What is the relationship between Islam and the other religions? Now this is my field, so I'm at home. You see, I feel happy. I don't have to fumble. I'm a master of this game in, on that level. You ask me about fatwas. You know, says, why you cut the throat of the chicken? I said, go and ask the imam. He said, look, he doesn't know. I said, replace him, get rid of him, get another guy. Why you circumcise? I said, look, let the non-Muslim ask me. You want to know? You go and ask the alim. About sighting of the moon? I said, you ask your alim. He's your man for you. You see? About talaq? I said, you ask your alim. The, let the Christian, the Hindu, the, anybody else, let him ask me, I can deal with him. Our own, I said, look, we have better men than me. Ask them. This is a world of speciality. World of specialization. I have specialized. Therefore, people want me for this specialization. So, mine is comparative religion. Now, the need for the label. We need, all need labels. And I read to you an ayah from the Quran. I wanted to speak on that, but I'll show you how the connection goes between what I'm talking about, label, and this Quranic ayah. People want to know what subject you're going to talk about. I said, look, you are making a fool of yourself. They won't give me permission to come and speak in the masjid unless they know the subject. I said, I can make a fool out of everybody. I can give you a subject and I can, from there I can take you on to anything. You know, generally, generally our learned people, they do that. There is no subject. In 15 minutes they can speak on a dozen different things. No subject. And still you have been enjoying it. Something with me, if I give you a topic, shh, I get straight jacketed. I must keep to that. And people force me. I was in bed. Sayyid Farid, or this Muslim views. He comes in and says, now we're going to advertise the subjects in the masjids. Those for the general public we had advertised. Uh, should Rushdie die on Wednesday night, you remember that. Then on Monday night we're having another lecture. Is Israel set up for destruction? There's a symposium between me and a United States congressman, Paul Finley, in the Good Hope Center. I'd like to see you all there, with your wife and your children. Now that's advertised. But generally in the masjid, I says, I know man, if I go to the masjid, I don't have to tell you beforehand. Because usually the imam is telling me what to speak about. Usually the qari is telling me what to speak about. That's, and I can start from there. That in, this, in the salat, in the qiraat, he read this ayah. Bulk of us, we didn't understand it. To me, that was Allah's message to us through the mouth of the imam. You didn't hear it. You heard the sound, the music. The bacha, the Quran, mashallah, how nice the Qari reads. That you understood. But what was he saying, you didn't know. So now, I feel happy to share that with you. I said, you see, the 
علي وسترين والذي أرسل رسوله بالهداء إن الفوز رقاد والذي أرسل رسوله بالهداء ودين الحق للزيرة والدين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا I said you see this ayah is also in two other places but a little variation now, because I have this type of knowledge now I'm sharing with you it makes you happy and it makes it easy for me I just pick it up I just pick it up or I can pick it up anything like the heels and I can carry on about salat and everything that goes with it I can lecture to you people I can talk to you people for an hour and you'll enjoy it you see there are people there are people, wallah, there are people. I know in the Cape and general, generally in the world, they just have to hear the name Ahmad Didat and they fill up the halls. And I am forced to give you different topics. You know why? Because there are people who follow. There was a time when I was coming to the Cape, we used to tell people, please don't follow. It will be the same subject everywhere. We advertise. Why comparative religion? And we tell you, don't follow us. Don't come. Leave the people of the place to come and enjoy. You mustn't follow. Guy from uh, Hanover Park coming here and the guy coming from where? You know, from Athlone coming here. No, there's no place even for you people, local people here then. I said, no, no. So we tell you, don't come. But there are times that when you go impromptu, there are certain group of people who follow you. Willy-nilly, whether you like it or not. I go to Kenya, same thing happened. They are with me. Now I am forced, I can't keep on repeating the same thing. I am boring them, the, the, the general public, they are happy. But this group of mine, that Ill, the group that goes with me, they are getting bored. Said, this is the only thing that knows. So I have to change, change. And now they want the topics. So I am forced to give a topic. I say campanology. Campanology. So there is a they are going to speak on campanology. So before the meeting, the chairman, a medical man, doctor, is asking me, what is campanology? I said, no, 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 you wait with the others. I will tell you people what campanology is. You see? I said, no, no, no. Shh. let me know, you know. I said, hmm, that's very unfair. <laughs> so as soon as I stood, I said, you see, the chairman <laughs> wants to pry and get it out of me, but I didn't give it to them. Then I went on to explain, what is campanology? And the people enjoyed it. So they enjoy anything, anything. Because you love me so much, it's the love. See, it's the love that people have for you. You can speak any nonsense, people love it. It's your love for me that makes it. You know, you say, you overlook my shortcomings, everything you'll overlook. Is Uncle is all right. Maybe he's aging now. He's so not like before, but still all right. So it carries on. The ayah I read from Surah Nisa. Surah Nisa is chapter 4. And I have been telling people, and I can't help repeating it, that if you have a Quran at home, Like this particular one here, which has the Arabic text, the Arabic Quran, and the meaning side by side, and a commentary tafsir, almost 2,000 pages, actually 1,920 pages. It looks small because they have used what is called fine Bible paper, expensive paper we have used, so it's compact. Previously it used to be this thick printed in India and Pakistan, same Quran, same page for page, but because of the paper it was so thick, so we had to make it into three volumes. We'll give you one, same Quran, page for page, but it became as thick like that. So they had to make it in three volumes. This we reduced it by using better paper, compact size. By photostatic process, made it smaller than that other unusual size. That's all, but the page for page same. Every use of Ali's, uh, Ali's translation in the world is the same, page for page. No difference. Because everybody is stealing by photostatic process. Nobody has the time or the patience to rewrite the script, set the types of the meaning and the commentary. Today, if anybody did that, it will cost you 100 rands each. If you printed 10,000, it will still call you 100 rands each. If you did all that, nobody has got the time to do that. It's too expensive for 2,000 pages. Too expensive. So everybody steals by photostatic process 
and has it reproduced. So you don't have to do all that. That typesetting, you know, the Arabic, the English, the commentary. It becomes easy. Cheap. That makes it cheap. Then mass production makes it cheaper. So this particular one, my society, we have done almost up to now, 185,000 we have given out. 100. And at the moment we have placed an order for another 100,000 of these Qurans. At a cost of about 20 rands each to print 100,000 and it's cheap. If you know about publication, 100,000 for 20 rands is cheap for 2,000 pages today. But of course, I am offering it to my Muslim brothers for five rands. Five rands, believe me, no joke, no, no catch, no catch. Five rands for 2,000 pages. There isn't another book on earth you'll ever be able to buy, not even the Bible, for that price. 2,000 pages for five rands. This type of a book. And he said, not bluffing you. He said, look, you write to me and I'll send it to you. No, we have them in the motor car outside. When you go outside, you can pick it up. Five runs each. And if you haven't got five runs today, next meeting, every meeting we'll have, including the Good Hope Center, it will be available. So you don't have to rush for the car and, you know, upset everything there because this afternoon at the Kippini Street Mosque, there was a stampede. People were fighting for the Qurans. I said, no, don't do that. Take it easy. If you fail, next tomorrow night, every night, wherever I lecture, the Qurans will be there, ending off with the Good Hope Center, five runs each. So in this particular translation, the big advantage is that at the end, there is a commentary. I'm sorry, there is an index. A very comprehensive index. What do you want to know about Islam? Anything you want to know, you open the index. I spoke about Surah Nisa. Maybe you don't know where Surah Nisa is. In your Quran at home, the Arabic Quran, you don't know where to find Nisa. There are 114 chapters. This is only one of them. Where will you find it? So, I said, open the index. Just like a dictionary. Nisa and the N. N-I-S-A-A. -A, Nisa. This is chapter 4. 4 is easy to find because every page is numbered. Once you found it, I say ayah number 86. Easy to find, 86. Once you found chapter 4, 86 is easy to find. You found it. Now, I want you to go home and check it up. Not only me, anybody, any learned man, he gives you any references from the Quran, make a habit of going home and checking up. Not that you distrust the speaker. You think he was deceiving you. You think he was pulling a fast one on you. No, no, no. When you go and check it up, you are strengthening your knowledge. You see the verse, you read it, you see the translation, you say, yeah, this is what the Sheikh Imam was telling me, yes. And the commentary, further expansion, some new angles, which the Sheikh might not have had time to explain to you. All this, your knowledge is increasing. And once you have done that, now you can share it with other people. See, this is the secret. You must share. To get more, you must share. But just by listening, you get very, very, very elated. MashaAllah. The Sheikh delivered a beautiful lecture. What? What did he say? <laughs> it was very good. It was very nice. Beautiful. What? And maybe he touched one dozen subjects in 15 minutes. Which one are you going to remember? No. Reference. And something you like, maybe he didn't give you a reference. Go and ask him. Say, yeah, Sheikh, where about is this in the Quran? So he says, this is in Surah Nisa. Where about what? He said, well, look up the fourth ruku, you know, the section. He might give you that way. Or sipara so-and-so, so many siparas. <laughs> but if you can get the chapter and the verse, very easy. You want to know, what do you want to know? This book here, what do you want to know? Everything on your fingertips. You want to know about marriage in Islam. Whom you can marry, whom you can't marry. Look at the end, marriage, everything's given to you. That you can't marry mushriks. Don't allow your daughters to marry mushriks. Of course, you can't marry your mother, your sister, your daughter, that you know. But it's all there, even that is there. You can't marry your aunties, it's all there. But, bulk of our people, they don't know. They're getting caught out. My daughters, meaning the Indian Muslims' daughters in Natal and the Transvaal, they're running away with the mushriks. 
See, because Indian to Indian, we are same nation. Allah says, Walatan kehul mushrikat ya hatta yu minna, and do not marry mushrik women until they believe. But who knows the Quran? We don't know. Here I find that our Muslim girls, Malay girls, are marrying mushriks. They don't know. The other guy is an Indian. I'm an Indian. He said, Didat is an Indian. He said, yes. Mr. Muhammad is an Indian. He said, yes. That Mr. Parker is an Indian. He said, yes. Yeah, Indian Muslims. They are all Muslims. Yeah. But the other guy comes on sing. She doesn't know the difference between sing and song. She marries the fellow. She's an Indian. It's another Indian. No. She must know. Allah tells you, don't marry mushriks until they are converted. And so on. Marriage. You know about divorce. And the D, you find divorce. There is a chapter in the Quran, the Quran called Surah Talaq. Whole chapter deals with the subject. Allah Bari Ta'ala, He took the trouble to explain to us in detail that if it must come to that, how to proceed, how to do the job. Don't do it the way your fathers have been doing. My fathers. When they get angry, what they do? They say, Talaq, Talaq, Talaq. Finish. Do Malays also do that? Do they? I don't know. Look, I haven't had a chance to ask anyone. Do the Malays also, when they get angry with the wife, and when they get rid of her, what do they say? Do they do that? Talaq, talaq, talaq. Do they do that? I hope not. But the Indian Muslims, my people, we do that. But that's what we heard. You want to get rid of your wife? It's just easier than eating peanuts. Peanuts you have to shell. This you don't have to shell even. Just say, talaq, talaq, talaq. Then they regret. This woman is to work so hard. Look after your children. Did so many things for you for nothing. You can't even hire an African woman to do that for you. So you want to bring her back. So they go to the our Molwis, what you call chefs. Our Maulanas. No, no, our Imams and our our chefs. We call them Molwis and Maulanas. You go to them. He said, Look, man, I made a mistake. What to do now? I won't have that. He said, Look, show you an easy way out. You make that wife of yours ex-wife, to marry some old man, like did that. But there's a condition. There's a condition attached. That that wife of yours and did that must go into a place where they can have sex. Otherwise it's incomplete. You must go have that chance. And then subsequently, if did that wants to divorce, and if the woman wants a divorce, and he divorces her, and she waits for another, how many days? 40 days? 3 months? Then he says, nah, he, he can remarry you. What is it? Filthy, dirty thing. You made a mistake. And now you make this poor woman to pay for it. Making her to sleep with another man. In her life she never slept with anyone besides you. Now you make her to sleep with another man. To make her pure for you. You call it halala. That's what they call it. I don't know, look, I don't know about the sickness that you might have among you. But now, I'm just only telling you that the fools, if they only read the Quran, they won't do that. Allah gives you a system that if you must, here is the procedure. Over a period of three months, and you start, how to start, when to start, everything is spelled out for you. Allah doesn't spell out in the Quran how to make salat. You know that? He doesn't spell it out. He's telling us, look at the Prophet. You know how to do salat? The details, how you stand, how you sit, your, your hands up to the ears, and this way or that way, all this, what? He said, look at the Prophet. How to make wudu? Look at the Prophet. How to do hajj? Look at the Prophet. He tells you, has yes, song yes, the details. Look at the Prophet. Look at the Prophet. But here for talaq, he doesn't say, look at the Prophet. You know why? Because it means, to look at the Prophet means that he must divorce one of our mothers to show us how to divorce. That filthy, dirty thing, abominable thing. The thing that Allah says, that the thing that is permissible but hateful in the sight of Allah is divorce. That when a man divorces his wife, the heavens and the earth, they shudder. Metaphorically, they shall such a horrible thing that our Nabi must do to our mother to show us how to do it. No, Allah won't do that. He spells it out for you. Do it this way. If you had the book, you read it, you won't fall into the mess. <sighs> this is the book. So, my dear brother, you owe it to yourself, everybody to have a book, this book. You owe it to your children to have it. It will improve your English. Wallah, your English will improve. Your children won't have to read Shakespeare and Milton to improve their English even. This book will do that. Knowledge of God. Spiritual elevation. Details about your religion, about everything. An encyclopedia. And you don't have to read any other book. Rubbish. 
They are hungry to read. The general world is hungry for reading, except the Muslim. We are not a reading people. But if you have any hunger, I said finish this book first. 2,000 pages, it's a lifetime study, this book alone. You don't have to look for books of Hadith, please. I'm telling you, I'm not against Hadith, I believe in Hadith. But don't waste time. Once you finish this, Hadith, anything, what this great man say, what that great man say, everything. <coughs> but priority number one, Allah's Kalam. And this book, I assure you, will keep you busy for a lifetime. If you can afford it. Buy one for your employer, the guy who employs you, the non-Muslim. Buy it for him. Present it to him. Or your employee, somebody working for you, present it to him. As a birthday present, as a wedding present, as a Christmas present, give the Quran. Five rands. And the guy will remember you for a lifetime. An encyclopedia of 2,000 pages. You don't tell him you paid five rands for it. He knows what's the value of this book. He'll know. He'll know. If you are half a dozen in the family who can read, get half a dozen Qurans. And once a week, Ba'd al-Maghrib, after dinner, sit down around the table, tell your son or your daughter, I said, read this to your mother, explain to her. So while the child is reading, the Arabic is improving, because it's getting rusty, we are losing it. Make the child read. And read the meaning. The language is improving. And explanation. It's explained to your mother. I've got explaining to you as well. Share this. And a bond is created in the family. Stronger than any other factor that can bring you together. The family around the Quran, Allah's kalam, becomes one. So in Surah Nisa, Allah says, وَإِذَا فُجِيتٌ بِتَحِيَّةٍ فَحَيُّ بِأَحْسَنُ مِنْهَا أَوْدُّهَا Remember I said, remember me saying Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and you responded with wa alaikum assalam. Some of you silently might have continued wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I didn't hear it but maybe some of you did. But whatever you did was according to instructions. Allah says in this ayah, see somebody wishes you a courteous greeting which I did, you must wish him something better. Something better. If I said just simply, Assalamu alaikum, you could have said, Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Better than what I have given you. You respond. That's Allah says. Or something equal. Not worse. Not ignoring it. You wish me something better. If you can't, you're too busy. Yeah, at least something equal to that. I say, Salaam alaikum, Salaam alaikum, Salaam. Good enough. Or you say, Wa alaikum, Salaam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. MashaAllah. If you can do that, Nurun Allah, Nur. The best of thing you can do. And Allah is careful in keeping account. Generally, we Muslims here in the Cape are good at wishing one another salams. But this quality of wishing salams is being lost in the rest of the world. You, my brethren, I'm congratulating you. Now don't let that go to your head. So far, you are in this country of ours, you are the best Muslims for that. And I'll tell you why you are best Muslims for that. What has happened to us, the Indian Muslims? The Muslims in Mauritius, the Muslims all over, what is happening to them? You are in this still the best of Muslims. I don't want to get anything out of you by telling you these things, that you may buy my Quran for five rands. That's not the purpose, you know that. <coughs> Allah tells you to wish people salams. Any courteous greeting, you wish him something better or something equal. Now, it's, it's a universal courtesy. People will accept this as good behavior. Whether you're Muslim or Hindu, wishing people, wish them, man. They're not Muslim, wish them. Good morning, your neighbor, non-Muslims. Khumara, Khainant, Allah, there are blessings attached to that. But this, this guy here, I don't know him. So our Nabi Karim sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said, "Wish everyone you know and wish everyone you don't know. No excuse. 
I said, I don't know the fellow. He says, wish him, man. Wish him. You know him? Wish him. If you don't know him, he says, wish him. You, the angels of God. These are the factors that bring people together. Love. These are your guardian angels. Your neighbor, one day there's a riot taking place. Say, so kill the Malays. Kill the Moors. Yes. The neighbor says, no, that guy is a very good fellow. Because Khoimara, Madam, Khoimara, you have Khoimara, Khoimara, that becomes your guardian angel. Well, I said, no, the guy is a good fellow. This neighbor, fellow. maybe the other Malay kill him, but this fellow is all right. <laughs> Look, this is a fact, they're human beings. You know, always, you are received, brought them into your house for a cup of tea. You say, no, no, this guy is a good fellow, leave him alone. Can save your child's life. That's that salam, salam. In his language, Khoimara, good evening. Sagabona, the African Sagabona. What it can do for you, Allah, that just that. What it does for you? Creating angels. These are the angels around you, they'll guard you, they'll look after you. But the problem arises. This principle is good. An African, I say, wish him. The color, wish him. Africana, wish him. Wish everybody. Wish everyone you know and wish everyone you don't know. But what to wish? That is the problem. What are you going to wish the fellow? Fortunately, that's why I said, fortunately, the Muslims in the Cape, a lot of you wear these kufiyas. So it's easy. Asalaamu As Alaikum, whether I know you or don't. Asalaamu As Alaikum. Asalaamu As Alaikum. But it's not happening in other places. We have started taking away, throwing away the kufiya. This innocent thing. We don't value it. Muslims don't value it anymore. And when they do, they go to the masjid, they take it out of the pocket, they put it on, and when they come out, quickly, goes into the pocket. As if they're terrified. They don't want to be recognized as Muslims. Inferiority complex. And the clever, they're clever fools, wallah, they're clever fools. And when I'm talking to them, I said, look man, this is a very, very essential thing. Identity. Identify yourself. It gives you power. It boosts your morale. It terrifies the enemy. And innocent. Nobody can say you're provoking him, you're looking for a fight. When this little humble thing you put on, you know what it's doing to him. This puppy. You are a challenge. 300 years they tried to convert your fathers. They hammered you people. They enslaved you people. Changed your surnames. Changed your language. Made you to do the Kung Carnival. Join them too. Our sons, our brothers. You can't say, no, they're not my brothers, they're not Muslims. They're Muslims. Who do the Kun Kanigan? Muslims, no? They're also there. Yes. 300 years, they did it to us. But still, you are there. You are more than what they could ever expect by natural procreation, biological factors. What your forefathers were brought here, from Malaysia, Indonesia, and from Bengal, this is not the natural product by physiological Procreation. Mm -hmm. You have been able to steal from the other communities, strengthening your own community more and more and more. They know that. Instead of digesting you, you have become the indigestible material after 300 years. Of course, under the new policies, we are now in greater danger. Previously, we were living together in District 6 in the Malay, old Malay quarters, here, there, and we were able to defend ourselves. Now, for every five colored homes, one Muslim. For every five colored homes, two, three colored homes, one Muslim. They dispersed us. Our son will fall in love with a colored girl, Christian girl. And our daughter will fall in love with a Christian boy, colored boy. And Islam gets diluted. Dangers, dangers, dangers. There are greater dangers now than before. That attack was a good thing. It kept us together. We were on the defense. But now we are relaxed. We are living together. You know, they come into our homes, we go into their homes. You can't help it. Your wife runs short of salt water, she, she goes next door. They run, some are run short of salt water, they, they come to your house. That affinity is there. And there is a greater danger in we losing out. <coughs> but now, the identity. The Indian Muslim, the younger generation, 
Very clever. They're my people. Very clever. And I'm talking about a headgear. They say Islam is not in the hat. Islam is not in the beard. Can you argue against that? Islam is not in your hat. Islam is not in your beard. That's all right. You got to give in. It's a fact. Islam is not in the hat. If you put this hat on a kafir, murtad, that doesn't make him a Muslim, does it? No. The Sikhs, they have better beards than the Muslims. You know, now I speak. Makarios, that bishop in, in Cyprus, you know, he had the most beautiful beard that you can know. I haven't seen a tabligi brother anywhere in my life who's had a big size beard as the Makarios. Look, admit it. Does that make him a Muslim? No. So Islam is not in the head, Islam is not in the beard. So I'm asking, where is your Islam? This is in the heart. This is very good. No trouble. Between you and Allah, no problem. Between you and Allah, no problem. If you deserve Jannah, He'll give you Jannah. If you deserve Jahannam, hell, He'll give you hell. He knows. He won't make a mistake with you. With a beard or without a beard. Or, he won't make a mistake. But I said, look man, me, your brother, your uncle, I want to recognize you. I want to wish you salams. When I see you, I want to wish you salams. You're depriving me of that. Suppose you came to Durban, and you're looking around outside the masjid. There are hundreds of Muslims milling to go into the mosque, but you can't recognize anybody. They look like anybody else. They look like Hindus, they look like Christians, because in our looks we are the same. At times in our surnames we are the same with the other guys, like you are. Mr. Brown, our half is our car, is a brown. And you'll find another brown is a Christian. Come I had a lady yesterday, Mrs. Johnson, she's a Muslim. I said, oh, your husband is this is also Johnson. I said, is he a Muslim? I said, yes. Living on Johnson Road. <laughs> yes. Look, but now I have to ask, are you Muslim? Are you Muslim? Mr. Johnson came, Mr. Johnson, I don't know whether he's a Muslim, but if he's got something on, I know he's a Muslim. I want to know so I can wish you. If I wish you salams before you can wish me, I get more blessings. Between our Nabi Karim sallam, and the Sahabas, there was a continuous competition. And our Nabi Karim sallam, was ever the first. The Sahabas were trying to beat him in wishing salams first, and, but they couldn't. They couldn't. He was the first. And he was the last to withdraw his hand from another's clasp. Last. Anybody shook hands with him? He's not the first to withdraw it. Like some of us do, you know, you give your hand like a piece of ham, you know. <laughs> no. He was the last to withdraw, that means. You have to withdraw your hand. This is what he taught us. He taught us, he says, you see, the younger should wish the elder first. He said, you see, the guy who's coming down the steps must wish the one who's going up the steps, naturally. The guy who's riding a horse or a camel or a donkey, he must wish the one who's walking. All this detail he gave us. But the problem is, what are we going to wish the guy that we see? We don't recognize who he is. And this, the Muslim, the Indian Muslim, he is going off. He's too clever. Islam is not in the hat. Islam is not in the beard. It's in the heart. But I said, now that means we can't recognize you. We don't know who you are. Unless it's very close relationship. We don't know. Generally, we don't know who's who. So I go to Mauritius. A lot of Indian Muslims there. And nobody wishes one another salams there in that country. Hardly. Some of the leading young men were taking me from meeting people. In the street, there's leading guys of the societies. Nobody's wishing salams. Nobody. I'm wondering, I'm inquisitive. I want to know why. Reason is because they all look alike. The Creole, the Indian, the, the Hindu, the Christian, everybody is the same. No identity. So now you don't want to make a fool of yourself. If you don't know, the guy looks familiar. But you say, Asalaamu Alaikum. I say, what's that? What do you say? You don't want to feel embarrassed. So rather, keep quiet. In Canada, the Muslims now, they say, hi, hi. It's, it's, it's safer. You don't make a mistake. You say hi. He knows hi. <laughs> you might say salam. What's that? Huh? You swearing me? <laughs> no, no, you don't swear anybody. You don't create problem unnecessary. <laughs> so when I return 
from Mauritius after this experience. They give me a chance to speak in the Juma Masjid, Durban. And I shared this, this ayah. I read it and I started to explain. I said, you see, in Mauritius, this is my experience. People do this one another. And the reason is, they don't have a headgear. See, they are shy to have a headgear. Finish, that means gone. Now you don't know who's who. So after the Juma, one of my dear friends, very close friend, from more than 30, 40 years, we are friends. Mr. G.M. Jamal, very well-known person. He is a sitarist, professional sitarist. He plays the sitar. So he tells me, Ahmad, he said, look, I want to tell you something. And you can tell it to the people. You can share it with the people. I said, what is it? He said, you see, our friend, the golden peacock, some Ali brothers, <coughs> at a cinema they had a takeaway. And we are very close friends. So he says, now look, I go and stand there. And anybody comes for anything, I'm standing, chatting, passing time. So he says, half a dozen samosas, it's all right. He'll take it, fill it in the packet, give it to the man, take the money, give it to the teller. So he's standing there, and a young boy, handsome young lad, comes along. He says, I want half a dozen samosas. So he takes a paper bag, puts half a dozen samosas, gives it to him. And he takes the money, he gives it to the cashier. Whether to giving change or not, I don't know what happened. He says, give it to the cashier. And he looks at the boy, handsome young boy, good looking. Says, boy, what's your name? So he says something like, Muhammad so-and-so. So why didn't you wish me salams? You know, you're a Muslim child. You should wish me salams. So the boy says, uncle, I thought you were a banya. Of course you do. I don't know whether you know what it is. You see, me, me. I am a Muslim from the Bombay province. I speak Gujarati. That's my language. There are other Hindus, they also speak the same language like me. They look more like me than the Tamils and the Telugus. You know the Madrasis, they are a little darker. It's just coming from different parts of the country. You see, they come from a place where the equator is going over the head. So they are better baked than my people. We come from a little north, the sun rays are hitting us at an angle. You still go further north, it's stilling them at a greater angle. So they are lighter. This is the less sunlight. People in Kashmir, they are like the Europeans. The Afghans are like the Europeans. Wallah! They look like the Buddhas. The children look like Buddhas, the Africans. In, in the complexions. See, it's the sun. So these guys are darker. My people are a little lighter. Because we come from a part of the country which the sun is not that intense. So they look like me. The other, the Hindus. Gujarati Hindus of my language group. They look like me. We have the same surnames. Believe me. I haven't come across another Didat yet. But look, there are so many Muslim Desai, Hindu Desai. Muslim Patel, Hindu Patel. Muslim Bhula, Hindu Bhula. Muslim Bhula. So we speak the same language, we look alike. So that group of people, the Gujarati Hindu, we call them Banyas, like the Jews. You know, they are the business people, we call them banyas. So the young boy says, uncle, I thought you were a banya. So he said, look, I can tell it to people. I said, right. Now, he's my dear friend. When we meet among friends, I remind him. I said, you remember? I said, yes. I said, you know, Akhi Jibreel, you know, Jibreel alayhi salam. If he wanted to tell you to put on a headgear, he couldn't have done a better job. Then, the, from the mouth of the child, Allah is making to tell you the, deliver the message that, Uncle, I thought you are a mushrik. That's what he's saying. Uncle, I thought you were a mushrik. That's what he's saying. I thought you were a mushrik. How can I make you salams? That means this Jibreel al Islam couldn't have done a better job to tell you, put on a head here, put on a topi. He says, now, nah. he said, look, I'm a Muslim. So somebody said, no, said, why didn't you wish me salam? He said, I thought you were a colored, you know, meaning a Christian. I don't know what names you, you might have used some terms, I don't know. He said, I thought you were such and such, you know. Uh, you see, so, I said, there it is. And still he won't. He still won't put on. Now that's a sickness. 
That to me is an unforgivable sickness. Allah is delivering the message to you. Put it on. Put it on. And what it does? In Natal, we are 20% of the Indians that we are Muslim. We are 20%. One out of every five Indian is a Muslim. One out of every five. If you count Hindu, 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 Christian, Muslim. Hindu, 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 Muslim. Hindu, Hindu, Christian, Christian, Muslim. But out of every five, one is a Muslim. In Stanga, a town some 40 miles north of Durban, we are 30 percent are Muslims in that place. 30 percent. I said, you know, if this 30 percent only put on a headgear, what you can do to the enemy? The outside. He'll be terrified. Because the others are all like sheep and goats you can't recognize. But you see the guy with a kufia. Kufia you call it. What do you call it? Kufia. Yes. Kufia, 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 kufia. And that's visible. That's what you see. The others are like sheep and goats. You don't see them as if they don't exist. But the kufia is visible. When that happens, it boosts your morale. I didn't know there were so many Muslims here. And the enemy, so, so many Sullah fathers, murals here. <laughs> terrifies them, Allah terrifies them. And our Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he gave us the secret of this psychology. He said, when the Eidains come, the two Eids, Eid al-Fitr, Eid al-Adha, he said, go to the Eidgah, in the open air outside the town. Look, this is not politics, your politics, I don't know what are your politics here. I'm not talking about your politics. You know, whether it's a judicial council or whether it's this, who, what they're talking, I don't know. And I don't care. I am only telling you what our Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said. He said, when the Eidans come, go to the open field. He called it Eidgah. Open field. For Salat. He said, Salat or Eid. And when you go, he said, you must take your women and children also with you. And he went further, further than that. He said, even menstruating women. In Islam, it's not for them to make salat. He said, even menstruating women. They are doing the monthly courses. What are they going to go and do? Nothing. Just sit down. Why? Why burden them? Ask you, why burden them? Poor thing, unnecessarily. They can't make salat. No, there is a philosophy, psychology behind that. That if this woman goes, every, that means everybody goes. When that woman goes, her children will be there with her. Otherwise the children got an excuse to stay at home. You know, the ma is there at home, say, no, even menstruating woman, let them go. So everyone, even the little ones, she's carrying one in her arm, there's one in her stomach. There's one three-year-old, one five, everybody is there. So, the enemies of Islam, they watch. Shh, so many Muslims in Medina. <laughs> so many Muslims in this village. So many Muslims in Mitchell's Plain. So many Muslims in Hanover Park. It terrifies the enemy out of his wits. We didn't know. You, so, Alhamdulillah, we are so many. Strength builds him. This is the secret. He's telling you. Psychology. Do it. But no, I won't do it. Why not? You know the reasons. Why don't you want to do it? Look for an open field. I know your weather is bad here, but go to the Guru of Center. Have the Guru of Center. Fill it up. Let the world know. Any covered place in the weather like this. When the weather is good, then it says open fields. Go out into the open. And while we are walking with your kufias and maybe with some Arab garb, you know, do show it. Man, so what is this? What's going on here? My dear brothers, this is what Allah wants of us. You build a community psychologically, you're creating a bond between yourselves. Peace and salutations, peace and salutations. Allah is keeping record of all that, He says. He's keeping record of that. So, the label. The label is the kufia. I have been telling people jokingly, if this is too heavy for you, you know, the gays in America, they put one earring. You can put on the other side. Or put a green, green dot. 
You know, the communists, they were putting red ties at one time. All right, you think of a green tie. That every Muslim from now on will wear a green tie. Okay, okay, look, I'm, I'm for it. Anything. You say we must wear earrings. I said, right, okay, everybody, let's wear earrings. That everybody will know I'm a Muslim. <laughs> but why do silly, silly things? <laughs> this is the cheapest and the best, the most inoffensive. No offense. Humility. This is the most humble thing you can wear. Nobody can point a finger at you. But if your life is in danger, I said, keep it in your pocket. If your job is in danger, I said, take it out. But as soon as you come out from your job, put it on. In your buses, in the trains, wherever you are, put it on. That's your time now. If your boss doesn't want it at work, you're working in an office, as a typist or whatever, he doesn't want to okay boss, don't, don't make an issue out of it. Because if I was in such a position, I would make an issue out of it. Keep it in your pocket. But in your time, to me, it's inexcusable that you take it off. This one here will save our mothers and daughters. An old man sitting with this. Somebody want to interfere with a Muslim girl that's passing by. He says this, what do you call the old guy? He says, he's looking, he's watching. This is an old man. He might not be able to, to stand up and lose him. nothing. But just because he's got this on, it saves our mothers and our daughters from insults, from assaults. You know, just this. He says, there's some sulla fellow watching. Some moor is watching. Hmm? <laughs> so, so, if the label shows your intent, what you are out to do, this is an excuse for propagating Islam. That guy is going to question you. Because of this, now he'll start with you. Good! You know, instead of you starting, he's starting with you. Let him start. Then get my literature. Free, wallah, free. He'll arm you how to do the job. How to crack his skull. And these literatures are all free. Yes, uh, I will be giving it to you if you ask somebody to bring it. Saleh, will give. Yusuf, how oh, Yusuf is there? Right, Yusuf, please, if he's here. Uh, we have a comic strip, very entertaining. Comic, comic, four color job. Look, Allah has blessed us, wallah. Thirty years ago I started coming to the Cape, I used to drive down from Durban to here, took me about three days. I stopped in Port East London, Port Elizabeth, and on the way, you know, if I find a Muslim shop that Adelaide going there, King Williamstown, Queenstown, ho 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 ho, collecting zakat, lilla, zakat, lilla, you know, five runs, ten runs, fifty runs, begging, begging, coming here, going door to door, zakat, lilla, zakat, lilla, for thirty years I did it. Allah has freed me from that. That I'm in a position today, what I'm telling you, 100,000 Qurans at a time, I'm having them published. I have printed this book, this book, Arabs and Israel, Conflict of Conciliation, which will be given free to you at the Guru Center. 80-page book, 16 pages, full color, four color job. I printed quarter million. You know what's quarter million? 250,000. From a position, when I started this propagation center in 1958, to print a pamphlet, we used to go and get a quotation, me and my secretary, Mr. Vanker, he passed away, may Allah give him Jannah. We used to go and get a quotation for 1,000 and 5,000. Then we have a meeting between us. He said, man, 5,000 is too much money. We'll print 1,000 now, later on, inshallah. If we can do it, we'll do 5,000. Today, we are doing 100,000 at a time. The pamphlet about the Pope, you remember the Pope? His, high, his Holiness plays hide and seek with Muslims, quarter million first print, quarter million. Then we did it in Arabic. Now this one here, a story in cartoon form, four color job, about Ahmad and John. I am that Ahmad. And John is a Christian missionary. I won't take his full name. You see, Ahmad and John. John comes along and knocks at the door, which is happening to our doors. Same, same, it's the same setup. Then the guy wants to share his deen with you. He wants to save you from hellfire. So he says, now how to deal with him? Huh? Easy. Now I tell you there now, look, this is what this Ahmad did to that John. You memorize that verse, do the same. Everything, the laddu, the halwa. I don't know, you have some nice, nice thing that you eat at home? I don't know, we call it laddu, we call it halwa, you know, our, our sweet meat, you know, Turkish delight, you put it in your mouth and it melts away, melting moments. I don't know whether the Malays have any such thing like that. Something nice, halwa like, you know, nice, sweet thing, like pudding. 
cursi stars. <laughs> like your cursi stars. You see? I said, this is like that. Take it and chew it, man. Enjoy it. Wallah. Yeah, four color job. Four color job. I printed a hundred thousand. I can't remember. A hundred thousand I did, but it might be a quarter million. I don't know. But sh it's being done. Shh. Allah has blessed us. Hundred thousand Qurans at a time. Quarter million of the books at a time. And it's all for you. Wallah, it's all for you. I want you to... You need it. Therefore, I say, he remembered, alhamdulillah. Just memorize the verse. Just mem you got to do that job. At least you do that amount. You memorize the verse that's given to you. And the guy comes to your door. You ask him, you have faith. Do you have faith? You want to share your faith with me? Have you got it? You can't share something you haven't got. So he said, no, he's got faith. He said, look, Jesus said, if you have faith, you'll take up snakes. And if they bite you, nothing will happen to you. You drink poisonous stuff. Jesus said. That, that is the quotation is there. Jesus told you you can drink poison and nothing can happen to you. Right? That's what Jesus said. That if you have faith, you can do all these things. So he says yes. So I said, right, I'll get you some end poison. You got some cockroach killer? Huh? So look, I want to see you drink that. To prove to me that you have faith before you talk to me. Finish. That khabis won't knock on your door again. He said, comes again say, hey, you got faith now? Come on. I've got something ready for you. Hmm? Some caustic soda with some sugar inside, cyanide. Come on, come on, what do you want to have? You make your preference. What do you want to drink? I want to know whether you have faith. And the khabis will run like a beaten dog with tail between his legs. This is privilege Allah has given us. Use this. Use this. Give it to your children. Memorize the verse. When they go to school, same. Talk, talk, man, talk. Any other literature you want, go to Roswick supermarket and pick it up. Pick it up. In this battle, you are doing my job for me. Wallah, you're doing me a favor. You're doing Islam a favor. You're doing yourself a favor. I'm yourself. I wish you all luck. And the label, the label, this label, don't throw it away. Preserve it. Encourage your children to have it. Wear it. Your children to wear it. Your girls to wear that little scarf. Encourage them. It will keep us, at least, you know, it will strengthen us in Islam and keep us united far more readily than in any, any other way. Wa akhiru da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. My dear brethren, if there are any questions on what I have spoken so far or anything else pertaining to this field of mine, I'm open to you. Any question, he said, look, the Christian fellow, you know, he came and harassed me this way, I didn't know how to respond. He wanted to know, he said, how is it that you eat sheep and goats, but you don't eat the pig? And I didn't know what to tell him. No, this is my field. Any fatwas you want, you go to the sheikh, the imam. If he can't answer you, replace him, get another one. <laughs> I'm at your disposal. Any question? Any question you have, you feel like that I can be of help to you, I'm here. You know, usually it's the Christians who get terrified, not Muslims. I'm your uncle, your brother. No questions at all? All converted? <laughs> Yes. Uh, the question is, how can we conclusively prove that the crucifixion was a myth? See, Allah Ta'ala gives us this secret in the Quran. How to do the job. Allah says, وَقَالُوا and they say, لَنْ يَدْخُلَ الْجَنَّةَ إِلَّا مَنْ كَانَ هُدًا أَوْ نَسَارًا that you Muslims will never, never enter Jannah. There is no heaven for you. Unless you become a Jew or unless you become a Christian. The Jew is not there knocking at our doors. He only wants political recognition. He wants Palestine. Just agree, look, you can have it. There will be peace between the Jews and us, at least for the time being. But the Christian, he is the guy who is knocking at our door. He wants to Christianize you. He wants to save you. Because he is the Christ died for your sins. So Allah says in the Quran, it's a kul hatu burhanakum. Simple. Wallah, I don't know how that for 1,000 years the Muslims are not seeing it. This is the trouble with the Muslims. 
You read the Bacha, the Quran. Forget the, the Malays, forget the Indian Muslims, the Arab, the Egyptian. In Egypt, there are 10 million Coptic Christians. Coptic Christians, these are Egyptian Christians. They speak Arabic like the Arabs. They look like the Arabs because these Egyptians were coming from that family. They descended from that. From the Copts. They were originally Copts. All, the whole of Egypt was Copt. They became Muslim and they increased. And the Christians, whatever was left behind, they increased. And there are 10 million today. Coptic Christians in Egypt. And they got the Muslims under control. The Muslims can not do anything. They can't implement the Sharia. 40 million, you can do nothing. And in a thousand years, the Muslims could not make one scratch upon the Christian. Not a scratch. Why? I'm asking them, I was there last, last March. I went to Egypt. At the Al-Azhar, they called me for a conference. Look, I'm an expert. But they don't want to benefit from my expertise. They call it a Dawah conference, but there was nothing about Dawah. Dawah means to propagate. How to propagate? What are your problems? You tell me now. And I'll tell you how to handle that. At least I will, I will give you this is my ideas. I said, look, this is how you deal with this. So I'm asking them. I'm asking the Egyptians. I said, you read the Quran? I said, of course we read the Quran. And I said, you understand what you read? He said, of course. Of course, they're not like the Hindi, not like the Malays. We non-Arabs, we read for sawab, blessings, Allah will give it to us. But we don't understand what we are reading. We know it's Allah's kalam. We respect it, revere it, kiss it. Allah will reward us. But the Arab, I said, you understand what you read? He said, yes. So I said, Allah is telling you. Actually, he's telling us all. But more especially to the Arab because he understands what is being told. The message, he understands. If somebody shouts in Chinese, fire, 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 we'll still carry on with our meeting. Am I right? But if somebody shouted in Afrikaans, fear, is it? Fear. Fear, fear. You see everybody start running, no? Yes, because it's in your language. And if nobody moves, there's something wrong with you all. Because maybe I don't know what the guy is shouting about, you know. But now you, nobody moves. Somebody shouting, fear, fear, fear. And you know, just sit there like goats. So I said, Allah is addressing you. Addressing all Muslims, but more especially you, because you understand the message. So Allah is telling you. Ya Ahlul Kitab, Qul, Ya Ahlul Kitab, Say, O people of the book, O Jews and Christians, La taghlu fi dinikum. He said, do not go to extremes in your religion. I said, did you tell them that? He says, no. This is gospel through them telling you, the, the learned men of, of Allah that I'm talking to. I said, did you tell them that? He says, no. I said, Allah tells you to tell them, Wala taqulu salasa. Don't say Trinity. In tahu khairul lakum. This is, stop it, it'll be better for you. In Allah wa wahid. For your Allah is one Allah. I said, did you tell them that? He says, no. So Allah is telling you. لَقَدْ كَفَرَ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ هُوَ الْمَسِيحُ بْنُ مَرِيَمْ Anyone who says that Jesus Christ, the son of Mary, is God, is making kufr. It's an act of blasphemy, treason against Allah. وَقَالَ الْمَسِيحُ But the Masih said, Christ said, يَا بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلُ أُوْتُرُنَ فِي إِسْرَائِيلُ لَعْبُدُ اللَّهُ وَشِبْ اللَّهُ رَبِّي وَرَبُّكُمْ Who is my Lord and your Lord. Whoever will associate anyone with Allah, فَقَدْ حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ الْجَنَّةِ Allah will forbid him paradise. No heaven for him. وَمَا وَهُ النَّارِ And the fire of hell will be the dwelling place. وَمَا لِلظَّالِمِينَ مِنْ أَنصَارِ And for the wrongdoers, there will be no one to help. I said, did you tell them that? He says, no. So Allah is telling you. Tell them. Hold. Say, يَا أَحْلَ الْكِتَابِ O people of the book, تَعَالَ وَكَمْ Did you call them? He says, no. And they're speaking the truth. No. 1,400 years, you are masters of Egypt. I want to look, we are in a minority. We are a minority for minority. The Muslims are in a minority. We are less than 2% in South Africa. We are a minority. The colored is a minority. In that minority, again, you are another minority. Even among the colored, you are not as many as the other, the Christian. Among the Indians, same with us. 
We are a minority of a minority. And if we are cowed down, terrified, it can be understood. You 40 million, you rule that nation for over a thousand years, 1,400 years, and you couldn't speak to your Christian fellow countrymen, speaking your own mother tongue. I want to know why. No answer. No answer. I said, I want to know why. You read this, Allah is telling you to tell them, ta'ala, call them, ta'ala, and you can't. You don't understand that? Ya Ahlul Kitab, ta'ala. You can't even do that? I want to know why. So they say, Husni Mubarak. <laughs> you know, he is not a good Muslim. See? Sayadat was not a good Muslim. You know, he stopped us. Nasser stopped us. I said, who are you bluffing? Mubarak is today. Sadat was yesterday and Nasser was day before yesterday. But for 1,400 years, there were no Mubaraks and no Sadats and no Nasser. I want to know what were you doing? You didn't do the job and you are not likely to do it. You'll never do it. You can never do it. You can never do it. I tell you why. I said the basic principle you haven't learned. Basic principle. Allah says, tell them. Produce your proof. Once you learn that, that all this the secret of what I'm doing is to the Jew. You watch in the Guru Center. Same is a fundamental thing. Anybody makes any claim, your proof, your certificate. In other words, you know about his certificate. You know a little more than what he knows. You are the master. That all this is talking about is bunker. Allah says, Illa zan. They only follow conjecture, guesswork, fiction. Yaqinan. For a surety they killed him not. Bal rafahullah ilayhi. But Allah took him up to himself. So the guy says, Where did you get this? It's in the Quran. He said, I don't accept the Quran. So you are forced. He said, Look, my book says this. He said, What does it say? Now you handle it. That's, a, it's, that's basic. Where? It's in my book. So what does it say? So you tell him, I said, what he says. So you remember when Jesus returned to the upper room, where they had the last supper? After his alleged crucifixion, he goes in and he says, Frida Fayala, peace be unto you. And when he said his disciples were terrified, he said, yes. He knows everything. Why were they terrified? When you meet your long-lost master, your uncle, your grandfather, you meet me in Durban, you're going to get terrified of me? No, you're happy, his uncle, how are you? I can't remember you, what you said. No, I was there at Mitchell's plane, you know, when you came to talk, and said, mashallah, come, come have tea with me. But now, are you terrified to see me? To meet me? No. Why are they terrified? So, the guy says, no. The Bible says because they thought he was a spirit. A ghost is spook. That's what he said. That's the answer. So now, you know all that answer beforehand. So he said, did he look like a ghost? He says, no. Then said, why should he think the man is a ghost when he didn't look like one? Puzzled. So I said, look, I'll help you. You're actually helping to kill him. To hang him. So I'll help you. You know the reason. You see, the disciples of Jesus, they were not there when all these things happened to him. What they say? Because Mark chapter 14, verse 50, he tells us that at the most critical juncture in the life of Jesus, all his disciples forsook him and fled. They all forsook him. And they all forsook him and fled. And so they were not there. So therefore they are terrified because they thought the man was dead and buried. He's thinking in his grave. Such a man, you see, you're terrified. Natural. So he says, Cake na me hand and me footer. Behold my hands and my feet. One did this excel. I am the same fellow man. Damn fools, what are you afraid of me for? So fool and me and cake. So handle me and see. Want a chies at me flesh and bianna. So as the other seen that I catch me. For a spirit has no flesh and bones. As you see me have. I'm not what you're thinking. Damn fools, what are you afraid of me for? And to assure them further, he said, have you here any meat, something to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and a honeycomb. And he had a bit of honey and four halaouachayilt. And he took it and he act in the very side to prove what? That is a ghost, he's a spook. <laughs> Talk to him, man. And what a pleasure Allah gives you. You slay him with your tongue. You don't have to use your fist. You don't have to lose your what? Master this. In Arabic, I'm telling the Arabs, master this. Why don't you do it? In Zulu, I've done it in Zulu, in Afrikaans. I've done it in Afrikaans. I've done it in, in, in Arabic, in Spanish, in Indonesian, in your language of your forefathers, Malaysian. Why? 
This is the weapon. You master it. Like in judo, like in karate, like in boxing. Practice, practice, practice. And you see, it's a privilege Allah has given you, but you won't do the homework. You want to take a pill, you know, pill. And you think you're going to become a superman. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> the pills don't make superman. You have to go through exertion exercise. And this is very easy, wallah, very easy. And the pleasure. Your English will improve, your Africans will improve, and give you more courage. Because now, you are looking for them. They don't have to come looking for you. It's a, take his own book, take his own shoes and put it around his neck. Garland him with his own shoes. What a pleasure Allah is giving you. But you won't take it. Then you become everybody's doormat. They use you as a doormat. They use you as a punching bag. It's a role that you have chosen. This is not chosen by Allah. Allah didn't choose that role for the Muslims. That you must become everybody's doormat. You know, wipe their feet on you. Use you as a pun punching bag for practice. Allah says in the ayah that was read at the beginning in the Kari read, And enough is Allah is a witness to this fact that he's going to make his deen to prevail with you or without you. But you rubbish, you think he's depending on you, he's waiting on you. It's a privilege he's giving you and me. Rubbish that we are. What are you? What am I? That you and I can do the works of the prophets of God and earn a prophet's reward. Is that your privilege? He's giving you but you won't take it. Then you choose this role, you wait for them to come and knock at your door and make a mess of you and your families. That's what you have chosen for yourself. This is not the destiny of the Muslim. Your destiny is Now mind how the mushrik might not like it. This is your destiny. And again, وَكَفَى بِاللَّهِ شَهِيدًا Enough is Allah is a witness to this fact that He's going to make His deen to prevail with you or without you. But it's a privilege He's giving you and me. Will you take it? And the way to do it is take this up. Do a little bit of homework. Just memorize the verse. Wallah. And once you're memorized, man, it'll come. Any excuse, you'll fit it in. Any excuse. You see that as I can. I say, anything. You can bring the guy. Tomorrow is July handicap. You know that? You know that? July handicap, the biggest gambling this thing in the country. They'll be spending about four million tomorrow on horses' tails. Will be gone. Four million. That's the least four million dollars right? they're going to spend on horses. And people will ask your neighbors, which horse are you backing? Look, he's giving you opportunity to preach Islam, man. He said, no, man, we are Muslims. You see, Islam forbids us to take chances on anything. You see, gambling is forbidden in Islam. And look, <laughs> opportunity for you. Will you take it? No, no. You don't know. <laughs> Were you running away? What are you running away for? Opportunities. Put on your label. That label is there. You sullah fellow, you mora. Uh, which horse are you backing? Say, no, I back that horse that never loses. In Allah's name, I give out. And he's promising me a million full reward. مَثَلُ الَّذِينَ يُنْفِقُونَ أَمْوَالَهُمْ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ كَمَا سَلِحَبَّةٍ أَمْبَةَ سَبَسَنَا بِلَا Whatever you spend in the way of Allah without any ulterior motive He says that like a grain of corn you plant you get seven cobs فِي كُلِّ سُمْبُلَةٍ مِّمْ يَتَحَبَّةٍ and everyone a hundred grains seven hundred to one and he doesn't stop there He says وَاللَّهُ يُدَعِفُ لِمَنْ يَشَاء وَاللَّهُ وَاسِعُنَ عَلِيمٍ I bargain with him, I gamble with him, and I'm a sure winner with him. This is where I put my money. I put my money where my mouth is. Help the people, help the needy. This is the gamble, which is a sure win. So, excuse, any excuse, get started, man. And the only time you feel that way is when you are armed. Like you have a licensed revolver. Then you can afford, you know, to walk bravely into that hooligan area. You know? You know that anything happens, you can pull out. You have it intellectually, you are ready. You are wishing, you are yearning for people to come to you and talk to you. If they are passing by those Christian missionaries, you can say, Munir, come, come and come and have tea with me. Yes, you will be calling him. Come, come, have tea. Send your son and say, look, my daddy is calling. He said, come and have tea with us. Because you know now, you will have the better of him. How? You got to do exercise, prepare. It's easy, my son. Yes, but no, this is not Allah's kalam. How are there so many versions of the Bible? 
But we don't have to worry about all that. You start with basics. Accept it. Every verse that we have quoted is in every Bible. So you don't have to worry. He says, it's not in my Bible. Everything that you see that I quote is in every Bible. So you are on a good wicket. He can't say, it's not in my Bible. So let's have a look. See, Mark chapter 16, those ending verses are not there in your Bible. I want to know why, what happened? Right? So it also proves something. If it's not there, it's not, why is it not there? If it was the word of God, why did you take it out? Because of that. <laughs> yes, my brother. Is there any mention in the Bible about how the Lord and Lord be Yes, so many places. Wallah, so many places. I have got a book. Free, free, free. What the Bible says about Muhammad. And we quote you verses in Afrikaans. There's the Afrikaans verses in Afrikaans. Because the first time I had a confrontation was with an Afrikaans Dumini. I was trying to learn Afrikaans. And I wanted to practice Afrikaans before coming over to, before going to the Transvaal. So I searched out a Dumini. And I started having a dialogue with him. And out of that came that booklet. How much? Free. Go and pick it up, man. And learn the verse. Mm. Prophet sal ek for hala for back. A demida for hala brewers. Suas ye is. And excel me word in some wonder. And he sal an hala se. Alas watak hum be fear. Memorize that. And then once it's memorized, then you can remember everything else about it. See, this is the key. The peg. On which you put on everything else that you're going to speak about. Once you have got the peg there. Now, around that you can build a story. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren, like unto thee, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. That over 20 years ago, in the city hall of Cape Town, I did a lecture on that. Of course, we might have been too small then. But now, it's still not too late. You can get the videotape. Muhammad, the natural successor to Christ. Another, proving from the Bible. You can get a videotape, but the booklet is free. Pick it up from Rossmith Supermarket. And there's no condition that you must buy something there to get the book. You don't have to buy anything. You just go along and say, I want the book. You go and pick up the book. They won't ask you to buy some kusi stars there. <laughs> yes. Right. Well, I think. Yes, sir. End with the dua.